Good morning, church. Good to be with you all. I'm looking forward to uh, walking through uh, Philippians 3 with you. Um, before I get started, I, I, I've neglected to say this other times I've been up here, so I just wanted to mention something. I've just really appreciated um, some of the changes that we've made even in this worship space. I love these comfy chairs. And one of the things I love is this work that was done up here to paint it white. It makes it feel like the worship team and those of us who are up here speaking are kind of more the part of the whole group. And I don't know if any of you heard about the controversy on that back wall, this, this front wall. Um, so I just want to just name it. Uh, so um, Matt Lichty, Lichty Painting, does a great job, did this work here. He didn't pay me to advertise. And um, I guess when the project was going on, we all know how particular Gene is. And uh, he, he came in and, and caught him at the moment um, pouring some water into the paint that he was using up here. So Gene had to talk to him and say, um, repaint and thin no more. Or shall we say, or shall we say he was a thinner? What's Father's Day without a couple of bad jokes, you know? Does anyone want another one? One more? Are we okay? All right. Uh, this is not a dad bod. This is a father figure. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, some of you know I actually had a Facebook competition to see who could give me the best jokes, so uh, we'll, the, there were a couple of winners. So we're going to go into more of the serious part now. Um, there may be some more funnies along the way, we don't know. But uh, let's go ahead to um, Philippians 3. Uh, we've been working our way through the book. Um, and if you have your Bibles or if you want to look on your phones, uh, I use the New Living Translation today. And what I want to do is remind you of something that when I've done other uh, series here around Paul's writings, um, I like to remind us that in the first words of his letters, he always tells us the intent of the hard words he's going to speak. And, and at the very beginning of the book, he opens with grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like JB shared earlier, you know, some of us may have good experience with our earthly fathers, some of us maybe not. Um, those of us who are fathers, we know we're learning along the way and we make mistakes, and it's hard to let go sometimes when you're the father and you've made a mistake, or when you're a child and you've received it. And we just want to remember that even things like when Paul's saying hard things, he's reminding us that what he really wants is for us to experience the grace and peace of our Heavenly Father, who loves us so dearly and sent His Son, Jesus, Jesus to be in relationship with us. So um, as I do this, I also want to note that um, I, I am just going to say, I, I had a rough week this week, and a couple of you actually this morning unprompted said that to me as you were coming in, um, there's been, sometimes there's been a question about, like, so, uh, what's my relationship to restore? Like, am I actually, like, on staff or something like that? I'm not. I'm a regular attender just like you. But in my everyday work, I work with a network of churches. And in two weeks, we have our national gathering where we have churches come in from all over the country. Um, it's, we're just going to take over the campus at Taylor University. And we have, like, um, pastors and families and youth groups coming in big worship services, about seven. And there's a lot of anxiety around this, right, when you're planning big events like this because the expectation is there that something good's going to happen. And so we have things that are human-created and things that are, I believe, the, the evil one is against. And so um, there are just a lot of moving parts, and there's been a lot of unexpected adjustments, even on my part. And let's just face it, we're all jaded, with these pivots we've had to make, amen, like through the pandemic and everything, all of us, we just kind of just want something to happen and just not have a whole lot of changes. 
And so just as Gene and Brenda were sharing earlier in the other messages about the fact that sometimes things don't just things don't work out the way we want them to when we're following Jesus, but he's still Lord. And and having this attitude of Christ that we put on when everything in the world is weighted against us to say, hey, you know, just let that person have it, or you know, take 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 the upper hand. Um, it, it's hard sometimes to take and put on the mind of Christ. And this is more of what we're going to talk about today, to talk about what did it look like to have the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start with uh, Philippians 3, uh, around verse 3. Um, he has some hard words in these chapters about those who are um, manipulating and taking advantage of people. And we don't have time to go and read all 21 verses, but he just wants, first of all, to point out who we know, who we know. For in verse 3, he says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. So in the New Testament, uh, in the NIV version, it says that we, we boast in Christ. We rely on Jesus. Um, you see, there are ways that we're tempted to put confidence in our flesh. Sometimes we think about that in light of um, kind of like our physical power and what we can do by our own might. And other times it's who we know, who we're connected to, our lineage that gives us some kind of superiority. We don't live in, in a culture like India where there's caste, but let's face it, there are times when we kind of lean on, different people lean on their family name and what their family has done. And in the Jewish tradition, Paul is speaking about this in the context of of religion and lineage. And he goes on in verse 8 to say, yes, everything else is worthless. Everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything. Everything else. Counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. This idea of garbage is kind of like dog food, and anybody who's known a dog, um, I don't know, like, like I give him nice food, and for some reason, you know, last year I found him out in the middle of the road eating roadkill. Like, dogs eat garbage, and that's the context here. Everything else I just counted as garbage. Now, is Paul saying that maybe... Um, like rich family traditions are worth nothing? No. Is he saying that education is nothing? No. What he's saying is knowing Jesus is first and foremost. Knowing our Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but when I think about lineage and names and connections, um, I think about it, maybe let's talk about job for a second. I don't think that there's a single job that I've had that I didn't get because of somebody that I knew, at least in my context. It's always involved some kind of like reputation and relationship building. Is he saying that these things are bad? No, I believe that that's not what he's saying. I think what he's saying is when we start lording over other people and saying that because I know so-and-so, I'm better than you and I can, you know, set your life's trajectory and tell you what to do, he says, lay those aside. Don't lean so much on those credentials. Don't exclude because you think you have the upper hand because of who you know. Instead, instead, know Jesus. Knowing Jesus upends everything. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in some of the next points. It reminded, it reminded me of an old uh, praise song about 10 years ago. It's like, all I once held dear, I built my life upon, all this world reveres. In wars to own, all I once thought gain, I counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. And as somebody who has said yes to Jesus, I can tell you that it's a, it's a scary thing because we do want to hold on to our lineage. We do want to say, but this name means something, or this line of tradition gives me the upper hand and some security and understanding. But let me tell you that saying yes to Jesus put my life on another path 
a different path that is full of life, that is full of hope, that is full of opportunity for the future, even in the middle of great suffering. Amen? It's not just who you know, but it's what you know, he says in chapter 3. What you know. He goes on in verse 10 and 11 to say that I want to know Christ, not just Christ the person, but I want to know and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. That's not something our culture wants to do, right? We don't want to suffer. We do everything we can to avoid the suffering and to numb the pain. But what does it mean to enter into Christ's suffering to say that even the worst things that happen to me actually have some kind of redeeming value in light of Christ's resurrection power. Sharing in his death so that one way or another, I'll experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul knows that in his context, he could lose his life any day. So whether it's suffering that doesn't lead to death or he might even lose his life, He's saying, I want to know Jesus as a person, but I also want to experience the mighty power. Anybody else want to experience the mighty power of Jesus in their life? That resurrection power? I just found out um, this weekend that I have some friends that I met in India that are actually going to be here in the States. We'll be able to host them in our home. I'm so excited about it. These are church leaders who are right now on the ground experiencing churches being burned church leaders being killed, extreme persecution. I think one of them said somewhere around 10,000 of their members have been dislocated from their homes, their villages, and their cities. And they're coming and they're going to break bread with my family and I tomorrow night. And I just want to sit at their feet and say, what does it mean to experience the mighty power of Jesus' resurrection in your context? And you know, That also means all the education in the world, all the street smarts in the world doesn't mean anything if you don't know Jesus and know his mighty power and resurrection. To not just know the victory of his resurrection, but also the pain of his suffering that I might experience the ability to endure anything the world puts on me. Now again, I want to remind you that Paul's not saying that he's against our knowledge. He's not against our education. He says in this chapter that if anybody has the right to brag, I'm the the greatest Jew of all. I know all these things that make a successful Jewish person. But what he wants us to understand is that that education has to be harnessed for the glory of the Lord. We can know all the things in the world, but if it's not aligned under our Savior, then it's worthless. It's garbage. It's the roadkill my dog coat was eaten last month or last year. And he says a little bit further down in the chapter around verse 12 that he is pressing on. He's pressing on towards the mark. He uses this image of like running this great race. He's persevering. He's pushing through the, the cramps and the pains of running that marathon towards the Lord, towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Jesus Christ. One of the things that this passage brings to life for me is um, I had the opportunity to have a staff member for a while when I was pastoring who was a young woman from Tupelo. This, shout, this is a shout out to you, Gia. Um, we, she, she comes from a line of, of, of athletes and gospel singers. And I remember talking with her about where do you come up with all this emotion when you sing? How do you, how do you harness something inside of you that makes you sing from the heart the way you do? And she says, you know, um, my people have generations of, of slavery, of pain, of suffering. And when I sing a gospel song, I sing for the women of my past. 
I sing for the grandmothers who toiled in the cotton fields with no hope in front of them, and the only thing is survival for their family and the hope of a better future someday. I don't know how I can convey this to you, but sitting in that moment listening to a woman talk about how she sings and she lives pressing on towards the higher calling of Jesus Christ because of the weight of the generation behind her who had that same hope but maybe never experienced it in their lifetime was a treasure. It was a sacred space. And I learned a lot being at her feet. This is not boasting in lineage, but rather giving honor to the witness and the testimony of her particular lineage. So the reason why I bring that up is actually one of my kind of favorite songs I come back to from time to time is a song by Bob Dylan called Pressing On. Now, I told someone I wasn't going to sing because um, you don't want to hear that painful. That's suffering. You'll have praying for the Lord's resurrection power through that one. But then I realized, how could I do any worse than Bob Dylan's voice? This is recorded, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but the, like, the one that I enjoy is by the Chicago Mass Choir called Pressing On. And it says, um, many try to stop me, shake me up in my mind. Say, prove to me that he is Lord, show me a sign. What kind of sign they need when it all comes from within, when what's been lost has been found and what's to come has been. Well, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. Well, I'm pressing on to the higher calling of my Lord. I don't know about you, but many try to stop me and shake me up in my mind. Sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's Satan, sometimes it's circumstances. But I don't know, don't know about you, but I want to know not just Jesus, but what is resurrection power in my life. Amen? And so then he comes to the end of the chapter. And he has some words that I'm going to read that aren't on the screen that are kind of hard to hear. We don't, it makes us uncomfortable, but it's true. He says, for I have told you in verse 18, I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about life here on this earth. And I'm going to say that last line again. They're headed for destruction. And I don't believe that that's just like talking about hell. I believe that this is talking about even uh, a train wreck here on earth. They're heading towards destruction, for their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. I like to think that that's someone out there. But if we're really honest with ourselves in our heart of hearts, there are times when these things apply to us. When does my appetite have control? When do I brag about things that are shameful? And how often do I only think about the things on earth and don't look towards the Savior? When I started a job out of college, uh, my, my boss promised me, I was working for a, a performing arts organization, and it's what I had always dreamed. I wanted to be a director of a performing arts center by the age of 40. And he handed me this book, and he said, if you learn this book, you will be successful. And I was so excited, like, man, you know, I looked up to him. He'd been doing it for years. And he handed me this title called The 48 Rules of Power. Has anyone ever heard of that title? 48 Rules of Power, okay. Robert Greene, it's been banned in prisons because of the content. And it says in the opening that this is amoral. This is an amoral book. This is simply the rules of power. A number of the rules are applicable, like your reputation is everything, or win through action, not argument. Um, but then there are things like never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use your enemies. 
conceal your true intentions. Court attention at all costs, even if it involves slander and attack, because that's still better than inaction and invisibility. Get others to do the work and take the credit. Keep, this is, this is the one that bothered me the most. Keep others in suspended terror. Cultivate an air of unpredictability. Or preach the need to change, but don't change too fast. I could go on, but does anyone else here feel just a little slimy when I read that? But if we're really honest, isn't that how things get done sometimes? So we kind of come to the why. Why we know. Because in our hearts, when we say yes to Jesus, we know that these ways of operating are really not Christ-honoring and are not indicative of one who follows Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want productivity. I want a result. I want to get a goal accomplished. But I'm not sure I want to resort to those measures, even though my heart may want to. In verse 20, he says, But we, we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lived, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power which will bring everything under his control. I think we have a slide for that as well. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We're waiting for him to return as our Savior. He's going to take this weak mortal body that wants to crush the enemies, that wants to keep people in suspended terror so that I can get the things done, He's the one that's going to redeem this body that wants to conceal its true intentions. And he's going to change us now and into the future with the very power that resurrected him from the dead and brings everything under his control. You see, I remember reading a book called uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And he said that what we think is that we get things done by manipulation. And that's what we tend to trend towards. But lasting change happens through inspiration. Lasting change and transformation comes through hope and anticipation and inspiration. See, he's tapping into the gospel message. The hope of Jesus transforms us and allows us to live differently. We're going to be doing um, communion in a, little minute, in a little bit, but I want to give a, a, um, a reason why we do this act together. You see, we do the act of communion together because we need to remind ourselves of what Christ has called us to. Even in his greatest hour of suffering, he looked on his friends and he called them together, and he broke bread together with them, and he had a meal with them, even knowing that one of them was going to turn him over to his death. Now, I already shared in my opening my own challenges for this week, and I'm still sorting through my human expectations and, and uh, anxiety around kind of a big event. And I know I haven't always handled everything the way that a citizen of heaven may do so, but I feel like I need to give you a couple of handles as we leave for just some ways you can think about applying the who, the what, and the why. You see, one of the things that happened to me was I found that outside of the control of the venue, over 20 rooms for seminars were removed from my access. So like we couldn't have the rooms we thought we were going to have. And I had taken the time to make sure these rooms lined up with the different things being taught. Two weeks out. So my human side says, where's the nuclear bomb option, right? And the person relaying the message felt the same way. 
But what it required was to go down and just spend time there. Look on the person in the eyes and say, I understand, we have a situation, let's take care of it. And then we took time and we went through and we found all the new rooms we, we needed. I don't know about you, but I've been around secular and faith environments where I've seen that kind of a conflict handled with one or more of the 48 laws of power. That is not what I wanted to do. And the Lord placed me in that situation while I'm preparing this message. And I think that's not uncommon for those who find themselves preaching. There are other things that I found myself doing this week to try to keep the who and the what and the why in front of me. There is a situation that happened where I found myself waiting a half an hour in the driveway before I came in so that I wouldn't dump on my kids. Um, there was another morning when I just went outside and I acknowledged the fact that there were birds all around me singing the Lord a morning song. Or there was another time when I just went out into the garden and I started working with my hands because I've been working so much with my head that I had very little left. And while I did those things, I prayed to God to reveal to me the beauty and the goodness of this world around me, that he might put in me the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ. How does that maybe inspire you to think about things this week as you think about the who and the what and the why as you work through your personal and your professional lives? I hope this has been an encouragement to you. It's always an honor to be able to share with you. It's a sacred space. I don't take that for granted. So thank you for that opportunity.